I wanted to dive in the deep end today to share some of my experiences. But, you know, I'm 55 years old, old and over half a century of experiences. And not all of them are the ones that people are going to be able to easily understand. Most people aren't going to believe and they say, oh, if you told them, that's rubbish, you're lying, you're making it up. Well, the thing is that for every person there is in this planet, everyone has their own story, their own reality that no one else can experience except them. You are the experiencer and the expert of what you have encountered in your reality. Whether others can accept that you're telling the truth about it is really something for others to consider. But I also considered it. I knew that what I've experienced wasn't really if people weren't ready to hear the things that I have gone through my whole life. I knew one day later in my life that that would happen but until that time there were these certain instincts in me that I would follow to learn and experience things from myself so that when I speak I speak from experience of reality, not, well, yes, I will talk of ideals, because if we don't hold ideals, there is nothing for us to aim for in the reality we are living and the reality that we are creating by our actions. Because every second our actions are taking us into the future. We are creating the future with our actions. And our actions largely come from our thoughts. And if you think about it, who are you? I mean, look at yourself in your body right now. You can see your whole physical self, but you can't see what is operating that, that body. You can't see your thoughts or what is your thoughts? They're inside your head that you're having them. Where are they coming from? How do they even come into being? Why are you even having them? I mean, the fact that we even have thoughts can look at our physical body. Yes, we know it's got a finite limit to it, our bodies. We are part of a of a cycle of a natural world where you come in, you live in a physical existence and then you move on. I mean, you don't want to be stuck in the one illusion of reality. And that's what it is. Because right now, the way I look at myself, I'm me and this is the body I'm in right now. I can't remember it, but I've been lots of, well, in some places, ways I can remember it, but I'm not going to tell you I've been through all these, you know, regression therapies and I remember this because this, that and the other, because when it comes to these things I'm very sceptical, because human beings can be easily led to fill in the gaps. You've just got to take that pure experience and not embellish around it you've just and the best thing to do that for, to be able to keep it in that perspective is if something unusual happens to you write it down after it happens so that you have the current moment that brings you back to look at and go well yeah now a couple of years down the track I look at that and I think well what I thought then and what I thought now, if it was different or the same, it gives you a point of reference to actually know what was going on and why you might have thought it was unusual. 
anyway, I've got off subject here because I, I didn't know where to start. And I thought, well, really, the only place anyone can ever start on who they are is in their childhood. As an adult, we all realise the longer we live, the more what we encountered as a child becomes entrenched in us. It's, it's like the core foundation that even as an adult, even if you can rationalise it, justify it, forgive it and do all those things, it still doesn't change that core um, part of you. Uh, what I'm getting at is that, you know, my, my dad was an alcoholic. He, he, he'd pinch my pocket money and lie to me. And I mean, he'd do all these horrible things. He, w he was sleeping around on my mum all the time. He was never home. And, you know, when he finally did walk out and leave us and we never saw him again, I pretty much hated him. So, you know, as a kid, I had those emotions and they became a part of me. When I became an adult and I got in touch with Dad, you know, years later and we talked and everything, I felt sorry for him. I just looked at him as a poor lost soul. I didn't feel a connection emotionally to him because he had never maintained that relationship. So even though I understood as an adult and could rationalise it, forgave him and all of that, it still didn't change that very core of what I went through with him. It's still there it, and it will never go away. I can experience other things, move on from it and get over it, which, yeah, long got over it years ago. That's why I can talk about it. I don't want to talk about it because my dad was never a very big part of my life. He was never there. He was always out at the pub picking up women and going home with them. He was never home with his kids or his wife. But I talk about that because each of us have our own story and our own childhood. We've all got things that were our own reality and they were our reality, they weren't anybody else's. And the fact that nobody else had them doesn't take away from your experience at all. So when I t start to think about the only memories that I have and what most of us have as children, the earliest memories are either something that really upsets us or shocks us or something that is really happy, you know. Like I can remember the moon landing and that was in 1969 in July. I was four and a half years old at that time. I can remember sitting in front of our black and white TV waiting for the moon landing to be televised on the TV because it was a pivotal moment in history that everyone was excited about and focused on and it was one of those wondrous things that human beings actually left the planet. So that entrenched in my memory and all people have entrenched memories because of the emotional experience whether it was good or bad. So as part of the normal experience too at that stage not only at the time was I sitting in front of that TV waiting for the moon landing but my mum was about to bring me either a new baby brother or a baby sister and I hope this one was better than the baby that the older brother that I had because you know what he wasn't very nice and he didn't play with me at all and I didn't like him so I, I hope the next one coming along was you know going to be so much better and I was really excited about it so these are all things that have, have been entrenched in my memory and I know when my sister was born so I know when it happened so this is how far back I know you can have entrenched memories too so I was four and a half years of age. So events in history can actually pinpoint your childhood memories. And through history, that's how a lot of my events have been pinpointed too, because they're associated with pivotal 
not only societal events but events in my life because at the same time I was that little girl having those very real experiences like the rest of the world you know the moon landing and waiting for the birth of a, another sibling there were other things going on in my life that I was to find out that grown-ups had no answer for and they wouldn't believe me what was going on and because they wouldn't believe me and they had no answers they couldn't stop the experiences so I kept having them but anyway I'll start with there was I w as I said my the coming of my baby sister was something I long remember and I also remember too being in that big bedroom on my own she was in mum and dad's bedroom in the bassinet for a few months and she was going to come into my bedroom and share with me it was so great because you know what I thought she'll help protect me and even at that young age I still remember thinking these things and thinking but she's a baby how's she going to protect me and you're probably wondering from what well the thing is that I suppose if I did regression I could probably come up with a story but I just want to hold on to the memories that I have that I know are real that stuck out so much that they are entrenched in my mind because something was going on of a night time that was everything changed I don't know where when or how but I started um, wetting my bed a lot something was going on in my life and it wasn't because dad wasn't there all the time so I woke up one night as I was wet in my bed and I thought oh great and see the thing is too this is at a stage where I've just been potty trained and everything my mum tells me years later and for no reason I just started wetting the bed again and I remember that because um, yeah I would wake up just as I'm wetting the bed and know oh damn and you know why am I doing this and you wake up and it's pitch black except you look up and it's not pitch black at, at the other side of my at the end of my bed is my bedroom door and that's usually wide open because I can't handle a closed door I've got to see if anything's there so I don't like closed doors that's said and done on the very other side of that closed door on the hall I mean my bedroom door on the hall is the back door it's straight opposite my door and I look over there it's dark everywhere else but the back door is this orange glow it's and you can see through it it's and I'm sitting up in bed looking at this wondering what the hell I'm looking at and coming up the back stairs to the back door is something I've never seen before and the only way I can describe it is this where well, it was like a little leprechaun man with a really tall hat that was as tall his hat was as tall as what he was and he was naked he wasn't wearing any clothes but you couldn't I, I call him he but you couldn't tell whether it was he she or it you know it was just sort of now as I'm saying it the best way to probably describe the size of 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 it would be like Gollum if he stood up straight in Lord of the Rings you know he's little like a little leprechaun man and I'm I'm sitting up in bed looking at this I'm sitting in my own piss <laughs> I want to get out of bed and um, yeah do what I normally do is go to mum but um, I can't I'm sitting looking at this figure walking up the back stairs the back door is still there 
I mean, I can see the outline of it, but I can, it, it's like an orange glow and it's, it's, it's kind of like invisible. And this um, little leprechaun man keeps walking up the stairs and, <laughs> okay, he's, when he walked through the back door, that was it for me. I ducked down under the bed. Now this is, I laugh at this because, you know, when I think about this, you know, as a kid, my instinct was go and hide down in the bed because I'll be safe there, you know, the covers will be hiding me. I mean, it's like I actually went closer to it. And then, you know, I'm there, you know, trying to think, all right, you know, this isn't real, this this isn't happening, you know. Um, you know, go away, go away, you know. And I'm trying not to hear or feel or, you know, it's just... I. If this was a dream, I wanted to wake up, <laughs> but I wasn't. I was already awake. This was actually happening, and I was, yeah, scrunched up in this little ball down the bottom of my bed, and then I felt these hands and this voice that said, don't be scared. I'm not here to hurt you. And at that moment, ah. Oh, the only feeling I remember is pure fear. I shit a brick. And all I did was scream for mum. And she came running and I told her what just happened. And she calmed me all down and, you know, then she said, you must have been dreaming. And I said, no, mum, I wasn't dreaming. It was real. Then she tucked me back into bed after we got rid of the wet bed and everything. And things didn't change. I never saw that little guy again. But then I changed my nightly routine where I was <laughs> standing guard. I would not go to sleep. Not for something that would come through the door, but these spiders that would come through the crack in the wall and the ceiling. There were these, well, I described them only a couple of years ago when I first talked about this experience to someone as like etheric spiders. They were like bluish, like, um, if they were like made up of blue light or lightning or something like that, they, th th it was a, dark room they and they were blue blue in it they lit it up and there was all these little ones that used to come out with this big one at the middle but the thing was I never ever saw them and I, every night I would stand guard for them I wouldn't go to sleep because I knew they would come and get me and I wanted to be awake before they came and got me I wanted to see them I knew they were coming and these spiders I mean, I ended up with this routine of a night time where I would check under the bed, I would check in the wardrobe, I would check behind the door, and because the end of my bed was right near my bedroom door and the light switch, I would turn the light switch on and leap onto my bed and jump in there to safety. And then I'd look up to the corner where the spiders had come from, and I'd stand guard for it. And then I wake up again, I've wet the bed, and go through that. This went on for years and I never understood it. Then experiences started to change. And I started to wake up. I would feel hands on the bed. And I didn't, I couldn't have described those hands until after I'd been into hospital and I, I'd been, you know, in and out of consciousness and felt nurses fussing around me and tucking me in. That's what it felt like, being tucked back in. But the thing was that with that also came this, I could not move. There was something... I was awake, I could feel all these things, but I couldn't speak and I couldn't move. I wanted to call out for help, but I, I couldn't do any of that. 
Now, when I was about 10 years of age, I ended up going into a hospital because there was something going on with the back of my neck. One day I just woke up and it was like this red blood blister on the back of my neck and it's right where the tags of things are on clothes. It would get rubbed and it would break and bleed and mum took me in and out of doctors you know to try and find out what it is because they'd never seen anything like it before and later on I found out they called it a pyogenic granuloma which is basically an inflammation due to an irritation so ultimately they didn't know what it was but they said look we've got a cut it out and get rid of it so it was only fairly tiny but they left a big scar on the back of my neck and um, they also flopped my neck around too much while they, they operated and I didn't find out until a few years later that they actually flattened one of the, the discs a bit in my neck and that's when I ended up with neck troubles and I've had them the rest of my life but so I was in there and I was terrified it's the first time I've been into hospital there was this thing that had just come up from out of nowhere on the back of my neck and mum was sick in bed she'd been sick in bed for months and that happened to her for several occasions with hepatitis Oh, she went all yellow. Anyway, that's that's a bit off subject. Um, oops. So I had this operation to cut out this blood blister, and the scar they've left on the the back of my neck is what they cut out was huge, and I've had that scar there my whole life. Now. After they cut it out and I went home, because mum was sick, I had friends take me into the doctors because they had to take the stitches out. Now the thing was at the time, like, um, they told me at the time that what the reaction I had with everything was because I was allergic to elastoplast. But I have never before or since had any of that reaction reaction to elastoplast and mum put it on us over the years before and after that never had this reaction so after they operated on me I was in so much pain and the back of my ne neck felt like it was burning and they took me back for a checkup and I found out that um, when I say they, I say one of my neighbours because mum was sick. They took me into the nurses and they said, well, we're going to take those stitches out. And I just freaked and I said, stitches, no, because already it was raw, it was stinging, it was so much pain. The fact of, no, you can't, no, no, you can't pull stitches out. So anyway, um, I'd had a reaction. This is why it was burning so much. Oh, I don't even want to say it. But pretty much um, my skin had all blistered up and when they peeled the, the elastoplast off that they put over after surgery it, it had taken the top layer of my skin off and it red raw skin was exposed. Oh, and then she went and got some alcohol and cleaned the wound. Oh, I wanted to punch her. And this is why I remember it so much. The pain. The pain. It was a lot. And I'm asking them what is going on. I mean, it's on the back of my neck. I can't see it. I don't know. All I know is what I can feel. I didn't even know how it had happened there. And I said what was it why is my neck like this 
and the nurse pretty much dismissed me because I was a kid and because mum wasn't there she didn't I don't suppose she felt she had to explain too much to my neighbour either my, the adult there but when I asked her what was it what is it what's wrong with me and she called it a pyogenic granuloma now I'm I was around 10 years of age and I remembered pyogenic granuloma I don't know why and it was only yeah probably about five years ago I actually looked up what a pyogenic granuloma was and this was something that I experienced that you know what created this irritation on the back of my neck that brought up this blood blister in amongst all these other weird experiences that I was having and as a kid you know these things don't sort of really connect together it's only as an adult that you start putting all these weird things together and wondering well as an adult before I even got to an adult because of a lot of the experiences that I'd had and adults couldn't give me answers I thought well you know what one day I'm going to grow up and I'll find out the answers for myself and that's pretty much what I did that for the second I could pick up a book and start finding out about other things that I wasn't being taught um, yeah I'm really glad they introduced digital libraries because um, you know I had about five bookcases full of books I got to be a kind of a book junkie and not just not a fiction book these were non-fiction anything and everything to do with I would pour over history and languages and religion and any subject science you name it anything that I could find out something about life and it came because I understood that the adults around me didn't understand that there were realities that existed that they didn't know about and if you tried to get them to understand what was going on well because of the continuing experiences that I did have as a kid mum used to every now and again I'd try and get mum on side you know try and get her to believe me in the end I gave up because well I've got a fairly large relative base that we'd go around and visit all the time and you know what I got sick and tired of walking into a room and it'd go dead silent and I think oh yeah mum's talking about me again and they're thinking about you know poor mum that she's got to put up with me and my troublemaking and my active imagination it's like yeah I know people don't believe me but how do I change the reality I'm experiencing none of you have got an answer for that you can say it's not real for me but well stop it from being real you know and I kind of figured that you know I, I've heard overheard some of them talking about oh you should take her to a doctor and get it you know someone to see if she's all right which mum did and that day well I was prepared for that day I told the doctor that it was because of mum and dad I wasn't going to tell him anything of the experiences I was having because I had also you know I was old enough to understand what happened to people that didn't fit in with the normal things that they said that things happened to them that other people didn't believe they called them crazy said there was something wrong with them and they needed to be fixed and it's like <laughs> I don't need to be fixed I need someone to explain what's going on so I think I'll start back in 2014 when I moved to Ganyawe at Chowan Creek just out of Yukon instantly I mean as soon as I had moved to Nimbin I mean this is why I moved to Nimbin not only because it offered the opportunities to join alternative lifestyles 
but you can feel the land. I know that's a strange thing to say, but um, this is where I've had to take a bit of a stop and think about how do I explain that there was, when you move to the area and you start living there, you start to feel the land, you understand it, like um, I've said in previous videos that the town Nimbin itself is actually named after the Nimage, which is the Aboriginal equivalent or nearest thereof of fairies. Now there's a, a river that goes through uh, Nimbin. People go down there all the time. I used to go down there all the time during the day. And it, it's a beautiful place. There is actually chunks of coal that you can pick up yeah, and graphite even forms there's all the various forms of coal it's amazing uh, the rich abundance that just washes down in the river down at the broken bridge because there's a broken bridge there that's you know the broken bridge and the thing is that while you can feel this connection to the land and you can go down to the river during the day. I'm the kind of person that before I've even moved there in 2014, I did two years of night photography. I would walk around in the bush, in the dark, on my own, never scared of anything. Well, the only thing that did ever scare me was behind the Corralbin Resort and even in the daytime that scared me but that is a completely different story so so I was getting at the point that I'm not scared of the dark I can quite easily walk around in the dark in fact people think I'm half bat that I can see so well in the dark I can actually see better in the dark being light sensitive um, bright light, I've always had to wear sunglasses my whole life because um, and I can't handle the brightness. So yes, walking around of a night time is no drama, even on a dark night you can still see light. So that's right, down Broken Bridge of a night time, that's where I was talking about, wasn't it? That's um, that's where this uh, concept of the Aboriginal image comes in. Because seriously, it is one of the few places that I've ever been throughout all of Australia, day or night, on my own or with others, that I did not want to go into. I went down there a few times. In fact, one of the photographs I showed here was of a frogmouth owl that I took um, down there with the red eyes and there's this I don't know there's this sense that you are constantly being watched and at that stage like I'd done night photography but I'd never used flashes and I thought this night I would try flashes because uh, I wanted to try and capture what was out there. So I took a few photographs and, oh, I don't know, I just felt very uncomfortable being there. And when my eyes begin to start to well up a bit with, you know, get a little bit watery, that's kind of like, all right, I'm out of here. You know, when you get the hairs stand up on end or... Uh, you just feel like someone's about to touch you on the shoulder and scare the shits out of you. Yeah, get out of there. So it was a place I'd never go over night time. You understand that there is some something about down the broken bridge and and something that the Aboriginals call an image that I do believe exists there. But in the broader sense of it too, that the whole I see that whole northern New South Wales area around the 
the ancient supervolcano caldera of Wollumbin or Mount Warning. Um, there's just a whole network of caves and those caves are all crystal. I know it sounds weird. I mean, yeah, there's crystals everywhere, but there's also veins through it that create a network that you would never have to come above ground to move from one side of the country to, well, one side of that area to the other. You never, and I thought this was a crazy idea that the mountains were full of crystals. You know, and that there was the hugest crystal in the world that was part of that came from this super volcano and, and what it did and everything years ago. It was just this whole impression I got of the place of how it was formed and what the land was telling me. And yes, I will get back to the experiences, but you have to understand that my connection to the land is not defined because you know I could claim to be tribal or because I could claim to be anything it's there I don't have to justify it to anybody my connection with nature is there and it always has been I mean and the story I'm about to tell you is pretty much three instances where nature saved my ass. Now I've had lots of car accidents over the years where I'm pretty sure there's been some kind of invisible hand protecting me, you know. If there's guardians out there, I've certainly made them earn their keep. But there's a reason I'm still alive. And as my doctor said, he's surprised that I've had so many accidents. And I said, no, what you mean to say is that you're surprised I'm, I'm still alive. And he said, well, yeah, that too. Because I've had many accidents that should have killed people, but they didn't. Some of them really hurt. Some of them <laughs> didn't. But um, the ones that didn't are the ones I'm about to tell you about. Been in this community in 2014. Well, it come up to the end of it my child support payments had halved and I was no longer as valuable to the community. They were getting a thousand dollars a week out of me. <laughs> they were doing pretty bloody good, you know. But cutting it in half to 500, it seemed, and not always agreeing with everything that they said and trying to get them to sort of show a little bit more common sense too. I alienated two of the three. And the other one was, you know, virtually keeping me from getting kicked out. And so to, you know, placate the upset partners of, of the uh, property, I moved out of the garage I was in with my uh, teenage kids, kids. As I said, they were young adults. And I went and set up a campsite by the river, or by the creek that led into the river. A couple of weeks later, that wasn't good enough for the other two. I got harassed, I had to get moved on. So I thought, all right, I'll go and ask this couple up the road. They're not even to do with them, I'll be right there. So I went and talked to them and they said, yeah, no worries. So I moved my tent over the other side of the road by the river and set up and I was yeah, living pretty basic there on my own. I was going up to see my kids every day and trying to stay out of the boys way because you know the last thing I need is more shit coming out of people that aren't going to listen to common sense. But then that again, that wasn't good enough. It appears that the people that I had gone and asked if I could stay there were actually on land that they were controlling and they'd pretty much gone to them and said if you let her stay there we're going to have to you know kick you off. So they came and told me and said all right I'm going to move on. 
So I pretty much went back to get my kids then and didn't know what I was going to do. Um, I met this Maori woman from the Maori tribe in Yukai and she said she that we could go stay with her. So the kids and I for two weeks tended out the side of, out the back of her. But you see, the people that I, in the community where I was at, the people, the, the brothers uh, and cousin, the three that are in charge of the community, there was also, they were at what I called the top house. Then there's the bottom house where um, there were tribal people living and they would come along, these tribal people, every day to borrow my car because they needed to get formula for the baby and, you know, go into my woolen bar and get it. And it was like after days of this, I'm thinking, you know, you need to go into my woolen bar every day to get formula. Can't you just buy enough for a few days? You know, why do you have to keep coming back? Because you see, the person that I'd moved in with, they didn't want this particular person with a bad reputation coming there. And then one day this guy came came there from the bottom house and he's freaking all out thinking that the cops are following him by helicopter and they're about to bust him and raid him and blah 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 and well pretty much that was it for where we were, where we were staying at this place. So I asked the people at the bottom house knowing that I'm still getting $500 a week that, you know, and I've got a car that they want to use every day, they'll give me somewhere to stay. So I made an agreement to go there. Well, that ended up being another bad decision. I mean, you can only go from one bad experience to another, I suppose it seems, but in one way it wasn't. It was about to show me that despite all these tribal claims about being connected to the land, it's the reality of being connected to the land that is, is real. It's not what you talk about, what you say about, what you say you know about, what you say your ancestors know about. It's the reality of your connection to the planet, to the earth, to the land. And I was about to find out that I am most definitely more connected than any of them because Mother Nature saved my ass three times. To understand the first experience, you'd have to understand that uh, in 2006, I had a very bad accident. They said I was never going to walk again, or if I did, it would never be properly. Okay, I did walk again, but it did change a lot of things after that. But after I smashed my hips up and I can't run, there are a lot of things I can't do now because of my hips. I'm very limited because of them. But because of this place I'd moved into, down at the bottom house that I just explained about, and under the circumstances I had, I couldn't live inside the house. I mean, it was seriously, I'd much rather go live at a tip. So I pitched my tent down the down near the river until I got moved on by the boys and I pitched outside the house. But anyway, during all of that time I was at the bottom house, every day to escape the madness, I'd just go down to the river and pull out the weeds, pull out the the rocks and, and let the waters flow through because, you know, the waters float up in summertime and it, it displaces a lot of things. It was like cleaning out the veins of clogged arteries. So I'm down there one day doing that and one of the kids from the bottom house comes down and I'm standing on the side of the bank near the area where it's very shallow and there's very big rocks. And as I turn around and to stand there on the side of the bank near the, this um, river, to talk to him, I lose my balance and bum first, I start falling back and I'm thinking, oh no, this is going to hurt. 
And it's one of those instances that I'd already experienced where it seems like so many seconds went by and so many thoughts. I was bracing myself for not only pain, but I knew it was going to smash my hip again and I was going to end up in hospital and in long convalescence. And maybe, maybe I won't walk again this time because I was older and been through a lot more and haven't fully recovered my body ever since. And as I'm bracing for the pain, I'm actually shutting my eyes and squinting, bracing for it almost, and then nothing happens. And I open my eyes and I look over at this kid that had walked, to, walked up to me and his mouth was so wide open, I mean it was nearly dropping on the ground. And he just said, how'd you do that? And I'm just standing there thinking, what, what, what just happened? I was falling bum first, I'm going to be in a lot of pain. And now I'm standing back up on the back of the on, on the side of the bank. What? And if if this kid hadn't witnessed it and talked with me about it afterwards, what he'd seen, what I experienced, he was watching me fall too. And then he saw me on the side of the bank standing there. That's why he asked me, "How did I do that?" And of course, the first thing I could actually say, you know, because I'm in my head, I'm shaking, no, 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 what, what, what just happened? And he's asked that question and I just said, you're asking me? I don't know. What did just happen? And it was really weird and bizarre. And, you know, it was something that just one of those things that happened and you don't, I mean, neither he nor I talked about it to anyone. And then I'm down in the very same spot and about this, the same thing is about to happen. And this time there was no witnesses to it. I was standing back up on the bank. But this time, because the first time I'd had a witness to it, I knew that it had happened before. It had definitely happened before because somebody had seen it happen in front of their eyes. But it definitely happened, so it, it happened again. And it was like, yeah, nature's protecting me. But that wasn't the end of the experience because I didn't only just get out of all the madness by um, going down to the river, I'd also go down the road where there's a spot where you'd photograph the birds Lots of um, cockatoos down there that gather on one side. So I knew this particular area well and also know what kind of birds and how the birds behave at this particular area, which is coincidentally right near a one lane narrow blind bridge. So if you're approaching it, you can't really see what, tra what traffic is coming from the other side. It's, it's a blind one lane bridge and quite dangerous. You need to slow down at the best of times anyway. So I'm coming back from Chow and um, Yukai along the, the road to um, where I was staying at the bottom house and I had someone else from the community in the car with me and we're driving back from the shop and we're just chatting away. And we got to the area just near where I'm already starting to slow down because we're approaching the, the, the one lane bridge and it's dangerous. So I've already started to slow down, but continue my conversation with this guy. When all of a sudden, a flock of birds, a small bird, flew, but a large number of them, flew fairly well close in front of the car. And it's like, it gives you that, whoa, you know, that instinct to pull back, but then they're gone. So, but you've already slowed down a bit and you still are slowing down before the broken, the not the broken bridge, the, the one lane bridge. So I'm slowing down even more. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, that was just a warning. And then another flock of birds <laughs> 
came across. This time, even closer to the car. And this time they were larger birds, still a large number of them, but closer to the car. And this time, the passenger in the car did... You know how when something gets too close to in front of the car and you think you're going to hit it, you grab the side of the seat, it's bracing? He did that. Now, as I'm thinking that, well, there's somebody coming on the other side of the bridge and I'm just going to sit and wait for that and I'm going to slow right down and just not be there. And uh, the guy on the other side of it saying... Um, you know what, you need to slow down, you're getting warned. And then as this is all going on between the two of us, as we're still approaching this one lane bridge, blind, we can't see what's on the other side, another flock of birds flies virtually right in front of the car. I nearly slammed the brakes on. Not that I was even going that fast because already I'm going to stop because I know something's coming at me and I don't know what it is yet, but I know something is and I need to pull back. And as the guy sitting next to me is telling me exactly the same thing and I'm put, as I'm, the third flock is coming across and I'm explaining, yeah, don't worry, I'm pulling up, I know something's coming. So we're stopping on this side of the, the bridge we're just coming around the corner to pull up to stop because we know something's coming. And sure enough, here's the guy in the community that has been one of them that has been giving me the most shits, speeding towards me in, a, in his little car. I would have had a head on with him. Well, that's, that would have happened. And the thing is, I'm in a ute with a bull bar. He's in a small, sporty-type vehicle. I would have cleaned him up. He would have been dead. And the other guy in the side next to me started, you know, after the car went by and we were going past, he was, he was already going off saying, wow, you would have hit him dead on and you would have killed him and no one would have said it wasn't murder and you didn't plan to do it. And it's like, whoa, mate, hold on. Like, see, yes, I've had witnesses to these events, but I'm not going to bring this guy out as a witness because he's done more trips to the, the nut house than the rest of them. And even though what he was saying was in agreement with me, if you tried using him, people are going to go, well, you know, is he just agreeing with your fantasy? So, of course, I'm not going to put him up to say, well, look, he, yeah, he can prove this happened. And who am I going to prove it to? It was proven to me. You know, in these three instances, nature had saved my ass. Three flocks of birds within... And it's such a short space between where you come round into that open area where the, um, before the bridge, you know, there's cleared land on one side. You can see anything coming from that direction, even in the air. These birds came out of nowhere. There was no warning. Because as I'm driving, I'm always looking around, seeing what's around me. I'm not always looking straight down the road. I'm seeing everything around me. As I said, these birds came out of nowhere. Three flocks. First little-sized birds, medium-sized birds and large birds. They got bigger and bigger and bigger. Same number, kind of. They were a huge flock of them. And then they were gone. And each time they got closer and closer. Well, you could say I was getting closer to the same stream where birds were flying through. I mean, you could say it in a lot of ways, but that day, not only I saw it, but somebody else saw it, and I didn't have a head-on collision, that despite whether the accusations made against me, I could not live with the fact if I did kill somebody else, whether it was an accident or not. I was given the warnings, I pulled back, I knew. And I knew to listen to those warnings because of all the experiences that I've had from childhood up until this point. If you don't listen to your instinct when Mother, Mother Nature calls and tells you, shows you, you know, certain things. And so long before I had the falling out with the tribal people, I have a connection to the land that is stronger than the one they claim to have. And that's pretty much why I called them out as fakes. You know, 
This is after they've already told me, oh, you know, we don't really know our heritage, it's lost, you know. This is a confession straight out of their mouth. And they are scattered. They fight amongst themselves. Each mob, each tribe, each clan, the tribes, oh, I'm this clan, I'm that clan. And most of them are patriarchal, you know, women mean nothing. There are some of them that are matriarchal, where the women are more in charge. It's still pretty tribal. So if you want to go back to the cave mandate, good on you, go tribal. Sorry, I can have a connection with the land without, you know, being told by people that have lost that knowledge how to be connected. I've already felt the connection. I was born connected to this planet. We were all born connected to this planet. It's in our blood, it's in our bones, it's in our body. And no one can turn around and go, well, I've got more right because I'm tribal. We're all tribal. And tribal's just another label, isn't it? To classify and divide, just like all the colours and the religions. All the things that are meant to divide. What about the things that are meant to bring us together? And I suppose that's why at this time that I'm prepared to, to come out and voice these things because I know that in the last 20 years more and more people are coming out about their own experiences. And some have been mocked. And some, rightly so, because they're fakes. The new age industry has been infiltrated. The new age industry has been infiltrated. The truth industry, the alternative anything industry, news, media, lifestyles, it's all been infiltrated. And they're all kept in this same little bubble. They're not progressing and advancing and learning. I see the same things over and over. And what I do see from living in this community is that these alternative lifestyles are setting up in opposition to the government. They are preparing for opposition, for resistance. In a way, they want it because only in that can they attempt to break down and justify their own entitlement. Because, you know, I don't care which side you look at it, tribal or Australian law or anything like that, everyone's talking about their laws and what you have to follow, what you have to abide by. I do not need tribal law to explain my connection to the land or to feel it. It's instinctual. It's part of us. I know we haven't taught, been taught to value instinct, but we should value it. Animals survive on it. We all need to use our instinct to survive. Scientists can't even quantify what instinct is, yet we all know it exists. You think that science and academia and all of these people can tell you better than your own instinct. You've got to start listening more to your instinct. You are, we are, all of us, part of this earth. We are connected. Anything that I've experienced is only because, well, I kind of figure I was born to experience it, to be in the position I am today, because, you know, that's that's another video, and, a, and I'll probably fill in a lot of the parts in between that got me to here that will let you know that what we experience in the physical world is a lot more thoughts do create reality to a large degree 
I'm not going to go too much into it right here, but I did an experiment years ago that proved, well, it proved to me by the parameters of my own test. All right, I'll tell you. <laughs> All right. I wanted to prove something to myself, you know, like you, these things happen to you, you have all these different thoughts that go through your head and you think, why me? Sorry, my, th my son was thumping around, I knew he was going to come in, that's why I kept pausing and getting interrupted. But alright, so I was going to tell you about this experience. So back in it's in the 80s. I've moved from Tasmania to Victoria. I'm working now. I've got my own place. And it was just sort of the start of the New Age movement. I had been to a New Age shop where they sold Nexus magazine and I'd read a few articles. And it got me to thinking about one thing, then I thought about another, and before you know it, I'm thinking, well, I wonder if that's true. Because, uh, you know, it was talking about the power of the mind and telepathy and that kind of thing. You know, the ability to transfer thoughts ended up being the, the topic of my thoughts. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to set up a little experiment. I'd been um, living down at Port Arthur for a couple of years and that was another run of bad experiences. I got engaged to this guy and left him. So I was very emotionally attached to this guy and so I thought, well, I'll pick him because there are other experiences that I've had before this that made me pick someone that I was emotionally connected to. To try this experiment out on. So I'm in Victoria in Melbourne. I was living in Hawthorne at the time and um, my one bedroom unit and I sat down and I thought right can I send my thoughts? Now the thing was that this had come after another of event that I'm not going to describe here but needless to say that um, I, I knew I could ring up this guy and could find out if you know if something he picked up anything without r revealing to him that that's what I was doing and the thing was that he'd had an accident and he was confined to hospital so there was a fairly regular pattern where I knew that he would have been asleep. So basically I thought well if I'm going to test this for myself of thought transference it has to be something that is really radical and random that you know someone couldn't make up and possibly come up with. You know, so you know it couldn't be something normal. So in my head I focused on him and I started telling a story, a really weird, weird story, following one twist and another twist that didn't connect to anything and just went randomly from one place to another. And I found it quite exhausting to go through it because I could see this, it was almost like an, uh, a video running in my head as I'm doing this. And you know, I stopped after a while and I thought, well, if it's going to work, it's going to work from that. You know, there's not not much more I can do. I, you know, I'm just doing what feels like you would do. And so I thought no more about it. I even laughed at myself thinking, oh, you're a dickhead. You know, fancy doing that, fancy thinking that, you know, and it's like, well, come on, yeah, on the other hand, you know, you've experienced and lots of different things, you know, you can't have a closed mind, you've got to be open to it. So, anyway, the next day, um, I rang this guy, I hadn't spoken to him uh, since he'd had his accident, it had probably been a week since he'd had his accident. 
and um, we're just asking casually about him. Like I had the plan to ring him, so when I rang him, it's not like I'm going to come out and say what I, what happened. You know, I was I was just going to ring him to find out how he was and if. I didn't know how I was going to lead into, you well, hey, did you have a funny dream last night? <laughs> anyway, so, you know, he's bedridden, he's had plastic surgery kind of stuff, skin grafts and shit like that, and he's in a lot of pain, we're talking about that. And then randomly he just changes the subject and he says, I had a weird dream last night. And because we had been talking off subject and everything, I'd completely forgotten all about that. And he's going through talking about this detailed weird dream, sequence by sequence, and all of a sudden it was the penny dropped. It was like, oh, oh my. He had a dream of what I was thinking. That is the same bullshit, random story that was going through my head. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I don't remember too much more of that conversation because I spun out after that. I, I was too busy thinking, oh, wow, it's real. I mean, it was so spooky. It, all the twists, as I said, I had set it up so that if it worked, I would know it would work because of all the twists. It wasn't just going to be a plain story. And it was because of all the twists I knew it had worked. It was like... Yeah, well, I kind of set it up to disprove to myself that that backfired, didn't it? <laughs> I actually proved it to myself. And then I started to feel really guilty. How violating that is to enter someone's thoughts like that, you know, without them knowing. And the power of what I could do if I wanted, if I had ill intent. I could literally um, put something into someone's dreams. And the question was, if I could do it in their dreams, could I do it in real life? Of course you can. And that's, that's why I've always guarded my thoughts from other people too. I mean, you know, people talk these, this day and age about putting up a shield to protect themselves. I've long had a shield because I thought that it was as easy to read others as it was, I mean, it was for e as easy for others to read me as it is for me to read them. I'm empathic. I feel other people. I'm a sensitive, not only in the physical senses, but in a more surreal world, one that is larger, that is part of our existence, but we can't see it. We can't see the air, but it's still there. And we can only see it by what the wind touches, what it moves. So the air is real, and you can't see it. And that's as real as who you are and who you are now has to decide a lot of things are going on in the world and all human beings are being pushed to make choices do you sit on the fence or do you take a side well the thing is that if you stand on the fence now that fence is going to be pulled out and you're going to be the first ones to go. The second ones to go are going to be the ones helping to suppress those that have been not standing, uh, sitting on the fence but standing up. So I suppose in a way I could send a very big warning to both the police and the military. You're all human beings. You've all got parents, family. You came from somewhere. You belong to the human race. 
Putting on a uniform and following the orders of others does not make you human. You need to rediscover that human side of you. You need to understand that while you are currently held accountable for all your actions according to law, yes, you are being held accountable for helping those commit atrocities against human beings right now. You are aiding and abetting criminals. That is your choice. All right? You are a human being and you have a choice. You cannot sit on the fence and say, I'm just going to do my job. Your job is not to be a dictator or to enforce a dictator's rules. Remember, you are a human being. Tell me, would you kill your mother or your father if your government told you to? Pull the trigger, shoot them? Would you? Because sooner or later you are going to be asked to kill somebody's father or mother, son, daughter, aunt, uncle, friend husband, wife, sister, brother. Does it matter what relationship? There's an old saying, there but for the grace of God walk I. I don't like using religious quotes, but it's a pretty good analogy that you know what, sometimes through no fault of your own and only through good blessings, you could end up in the same situation. And what are people doing about the situations that are occurring in real life out there? Like in Victoria, what are people doing to help their fellow man? We're going online, we're doing videos. We're doing videos of them out in the street when they're getting attacked by the police. We're standing by, being complicit while the cops commit a crime. When I see a hundred stand by, mouth off and video. So what? They come charging at you with something. So what? They are armed. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, and sure as hell, if I was there, broken hip, you know, replaced, or not replaced, but rebuilt and vulnerable, I'd still be trying to, well, I can't run, but I'd try and, I wouldn't run. I'd be calling to everybody, get the cops, get the cops off that person. There are more of us than there are of them. And we need to pull it back to the fact that you know what, they're looking like a frickin' armed militia when you go out there. I've looked at videos of the Melbourne police. Seriously, how much more shit do you need to carry on your body? For what? For people walking down the street? It's ridiculous. Yes, and what are the criminals doing in the meantime? Tell me. While you're stopping people and looking at their ID for walking down the street when they're allowed to that one hour a day, what are all the crooks doing? Or did the crooks suddenly disappear? Come on. They're a, they're a joke at what's going on. And if you listen to anything about what other people have said about all the conditions that Victorians are living under, it, it's, it wasn't even that bad the first year of the second uh, the yeah the second world war the first year of occupation when people were being terrorized then it wasn't as bad in the first year and they've done it within months in victoria if you got to consider like in the world war it spread from one place to another it's not going to stay in victoria and there's also this talk about the Chinese involvement. 
I'm hearing it about more places now. I don't know how much to believe about it. The Chinese in Melbourne, the Chinese in Canada. But then we are both Commonwealth nations, aren't we? Belong to the Queen. And it is a matter of controlling larger areas. New Zealand's got its own lockdown and control now at the moment, so. And it's not as big, it's got two small islands. That's like trying to control two Tassies, you know. Let's hope they forget about Tassie to the large degree. Even though we're just over the border from Victoria, we've still got to get across that water and, and be bothered. I mean, you know, we're contained on an island. And seriously, I'm born and bred Tasmanian. I know that if I needed to, I could disappear in the wilderness and you'd never find me. Not with a pack of dogs and a bunch of, <laughs> bunch of men and satellite. Nature protects me, it always has. From my own stupidity and that of others. But anyway, so at this time, when all the coronavirus started at the beginning of the year, I was ready for what was coming. I knew there was a big event, had no idea it would be what it is, nor to the level it was going to be. I knew that... And the picture of when you know that people are going to seemingly normal people are going to turn insane. You can't even picture that. But then 2020 happens and Corona happens and you don't need to picture it. It's there everywhere on the internet. The face of a, of a larger agenda that is going on behind closed doors and has been going on for many years. And I've got a lot more to tell people about the dangers that we face and how that you don't need to face those dangers with fear. You need to face them with the knowledge that you have self-power and choice. That who you are and what you are, living in the body you are, even when the body is gone and you stop experiencing this particular illusion of reality, there will be more. And I guarantee you, you've, you know, I, they call it reincarnation, but I do, do believe that each soul that is living in this planet at the time, well, except for a very f few new souls that are starting to come in to help at this time, but um, there are old souls. Everyone's experienced more than just this life. It's more than just this life that makes up who they are and what they will be once they leave the physical flesh and blood. You don't have to be worried that, you know, you're going to die and it's going to be terrible because everything's going to end. Well, if you've been a bit shitty in this life and you've been a bit nasty, like some of these people that are demonstrating how nasty you can be, well, you can expect their next uh, rerun isn't going to be a very pleasant one. But for the most part, whilst to know this is coming, and it's not going to be something that changes overnight or by one single event. It's going to take time. And it will sort the wheat from the chaff. People will be challenged like they never have. And there will be no fence for people to sit on. Only the fence that you're willing to break down that others try and put around you and confine you into and tell you what you are, who you can be and how you should experience this reality that the second you were born in this life no one's got the right to tell you how to live your life or what to do with it and seriously if you wanted to go in the middle of nowhere and not live by anybody's rules that should be your right too live by the land yeah so 
I've gone in a lot of different directions and said a lot of different things, probably things I didn't really intend to bring up, gone on for a long time. But unless I start telling people about the things that go on in life that, you know what, you think the shit that's going on in the world right now is crazy? You ought to know what's going on in my life. And because of that, I can tell you that humanity is going to come out of this. It's going to be a battle, yeah. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. It's going to be a mess. Things are going to get much, much worse. In fact, things are going to tip next month. Maybe physically. Maybe just by a dramatic decision that's going to affect the world in a very different way that later will manifest physically but yeah, something is coming and you don't need to be psychic or anything to figure that one out anyway do you I mean the progression of any plan is to take it one step further and that's what they seem to be doing escalating it one step more one step more one step more to take away more and more and more to bring in more laws to take away more rights incremental piece by piece drop by drop they are taking things away I can't wait another 20 years to do it you know piece by piece so nobody notices this is yeah game time people you're either going to bring it or you're going to get buried by it you just start doing some soul searching don't be afraid of anything stand true with what you feel and believe as instinct as as intuition don't let others sway you from your path stand up stand in your own power and then you might actually find that a different power is going to come to you one that you couldn't anticipate is even there one I've experienced a little bit of in many different ways throughout my whole entire life we are supported somehow by something we can't see start trusting in yourself start connecting more to who you are and being true to that anyway as I said I've talked a lot gone deep enough I'll say goodbye catch you next time